Hi folks, Matt Easton, Scholar Gladiatoria here. So, the topic I want to talk about in this video is objectives. Objectives in sparring, objectives in combat. Um, and very simply, it's that in most fighting situations, two people, because they either have to fight, either they're forced into that situation for some reason, or one of them wants to fight, or both of them want to fight, the latter situation there might be a duel, for example, both people want to fight, a situation where both people have to fight might be um, a sort of war situation where both people are, are, are drafted soldiers and they're being forced into, into combat. A situation where one person wants to fight but another person might not want to is a self-defence situation where one person might be drunk or angry or have a vendetta of some sort and the other person doesn't want to fight but is fighting for self-defence reasons. So there's all sorts of scenarios where two people fight each other and they lead to very different types of fight and very different um, sort of eventualities and results and, and just the way that the fight might look as well. And that's even ignoring all of the other uh, contextual factors such as where they're fighting, whether it's night or day, what kind of weather it is, what kind of ground they're on, whether there's multiple opponents or whether it's just two people, whether they've got weapons or they're unarmed or uh, they're improvised weapons or weapons that were planned and they're carrying weapons, what type of weapons, so many different variables. But if we just take this at its most kind of basic level and talk about objectives for a minute. So, I've been uh, running my club, Scholar Gladiatoria, in London since, officially anyway, since 2001. We were unofficially um, started in the year 2000. And I've been training in HEMA since 1997. And um, over that time, I've had many um, periods of time when my training partners stayed the same for a period of time. Um, that's not to say that, obviously, new students were coming in and out of groups that I was in or groups that I was running. Um, but in terms of the more senior students, they often stay the same for quite a long, protracted period of time. And what can happen, and I'm sure many of you out there when you've been training in martial arts or even sports of any sort really, um, where you always have the same opponent, you get to know each other very well. And it can, you can get yourself into a real... Um, sort of working within a box, and it's very difficult to break out of that box because you know your... Um, opponent who's actually a training partner, you know them very well um, and obviously you're, most of the time you're not trying to hurt each other, you're, you're trying not to hurt each other, um, but you know them very well and you know the kind of things they do, you know their tricks, you know their techniques, you know what they know. Occasionally your opponents or training partners might level up, they might suddenly get better and this happens and in my experience uh, progression in martial arts is not normally uh, a curve like that, it's usually in little steps uh, and sometimes I've known training partners and I still see it to this very day who I've known for years um, and they kind of on the same level for years and then suddenly they get better um, and it just happens like that. Um, but you can get into a situation where you very much know your training partners, you know your opponents, and it's very difficult to get meaningful sparring with them because you always kind of know what each other's going to do and that kind of cancels out therefore. Real fights are very rarely like this because of course when you fight someone, um, whether it's self-defense or war or duel or whatever, you usually don't know that much about how your opponent fights um, and you usually have to find out very very quickly what kind of opponent they are, get the measure of them and fight the best that you can against that kind of opponent. Um, and equally, it, it, even if you know a bit about them, the psychology of the situation might mean that uh, in one given context they fight very aggressively and another they fight defensively. Um, you know, they, they could be, as mentioned before, they could be drunk or uh, they could be tired, they could be fatigued from marching, all sorts of um, variables in there. So you never really know what you're going to get with an opponent. And the same goes in tournaments to an extent as well. Um, and I think that's one of the main virtues of competition fighting. I know a few people, including a few instructors, who only fight within their groups. And I really think that they're missing out on a big um, opportunity in HEMA, or in any martial arts or fencing or whatever, 
um, of coming up against people where you really don't know what to expect when you start fighting them. And to me, that's much more like a real fighting situation. It's very, very interesting. It's also very nerve-wracking. I find it, you know, I get very nervous in competitions, not just because of what people might think of me or what I might think about my performance of these kind of things, but also because you can't to fight someone. And even if you've seen them fight someone else, you might have some clues about how they're going to fight. Until you're actually fighting someone, it's it's a very different it's a very different experience and and you you don't really know what to expect from your opponent. Um, I had a situation this year when I came up against someone in tournament and I'd seen that person fight in tournament before, but when they came up against me, they fight they fought entirely differently to how I'd seen them fight in the past. So you never know what you're going to get with an opponent unless it's a regular training partner in a tournament situation. And obviously in real life. This is true as well. Now going back to objectives, um, the real point I want to make is that I have found training within a club or even within two or three clubs, you get to know your opponents and you can kind of get stuck in this box and to break the um, sparring or um, sort of training experience out of that box and experience a bit more unpredictability um, and also a bit more realism from my point of view. Uh, a really useful tool is objective-based sparring, and this is something that in Scholar Gladiatoria, at least the SG1 class in London, and uh, to a degree our, our Woking class as well, we are starting to bring in more objective-based sparring. So rather than just starting, um, starting about and going, okay, let's fight to five points or ten points or whatever you want to fight to under this rule set, off we go, da 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 da, and we're basically both trying to do the same thing. What we've started doing is actually giving people jobs and this is more like most real fights because in most real fights you're not just trying to beat the opponent in a duel that might be the, the, the situation but in many fights that's not the situation that's not the context in many fights one person might be trying to escape or hold ground hold the line or defend someone um, or just defend themselves um, they might be trying to delay so the police can arrive or other their comrades can arrive. There's all sorts of different scenarios to a fight. Um, and equally, an attacker, someone who starts the fight essentially, assuming that it's not a duel and both people have agreed to fight, um, the attacker might have many different objectives. They might be trying to kill you as quickly as possible. They might be very aggressive. They might be... Um, they might be delaying themselves so that backup can come and they can swarm you and take you out as a group. There's all sorts of... They might be trying to steal something from you. They might not necessarily be trying to kill you. They might be trying to disarm you, uh, to arrest you, for example, if they're police. Um, or, you know, um, like I say, to, to rob something off you. They might think, well, fine, if I can, you know, incapacitate the person and rob from them, steal from them, I'm not that bothered about killing them or, um, or whatever. And there are other contextual things you can bring into objective-based sparring or tournaments as well, where you can say, for example, one person's um, sword um, is an S-stock and can't cut, it can only thrust, or you could say, um, the example I gave before, one person, your your objective is to disarm the opponent, um, maybe because you want to, in a medieval context, you might want to take them ransom, uh, ransom them to take them uh, hostage and ransom them to their um, family because there's lots of money involved in that. Um, or uh, context to do with what they're wearing. You could say they're wearing lots of winter clothing and they're more they're only really vulnerable in let's say their legs and their heads um, and their bodies and uh, covered with a big coat or these kind of things. So. We're starting to bring in random, and this is something we've played with for many, many years, but we're starting to do it more in our sessions at the moment. And I think it's really yielding some interesting results. And I think one of the key reasons for that is not only because real fights have objectives and context to them, which sparring generally, or generally doesn't, or only has one context and only has one objective, and that is to win a number of points, which is not very like most fights. Um, but additionally, it has an added training benefit. And that training benefit is that, generally speaking, regardless of whether it's someone you like or someone you don't particularly like, or whether it's someone you train with a lot or someone you don't train with very often, generally speaking in sparring, most people are trying to do as well as they can. That is, get hit as few times as possible and hit the opponent as many times as possible. 
However, one of the problems with that is that means that, and this is very much the case in tournaments, and you can see it clearly, people limit themselves to the techniques that they know they can most reliably make work. And the problem, therefore, and I've seen this over the course of many years in, in my club, but I've seen it in other people's clubs and I've seen it in tournaments, um, the problem, therefore, is people don't expand their repertoire. They stick to just doing the same old thing over and over and over again. And unfortunately, some people who aren't even very good still stick to doing the same thing over and over and over again. And if there isn't an impetus, an almost a freeing uh, mechanism, to encourage them to try new things and practice new things with inspiring, um, then they're not going to do it and they're not going to learn how to do those new techniques in a sparring context or in a fighting context. An example of this is, for example, let's say we have an objective-based bout and we say to one of the fighters, your objective is to just be fairly aggressive, just to try and hit the opponent as many times as possible but also, while, you know, not being kamikaze, because that's kind of silly, but trying to hit them as many times as possible and be quite forward and aggressive. Now, that's a very good thing for someone to practice who's generally a defensive fighter. I'm generally quite a defensive fighter, so it's good for me to practice being more offensive. If you now say to the other person, your objective is to uh, defend yourself really, really well, try and, try and not get hit at all, but also try and disarm the attacker, okay? Now, very often, um, people don't practice disarms because they're, generally speaking, quite technically difficult for most people. Some people are good at it. Um, and so that means that person is now practicing their def defense, with their, whatever weapons they're using. They're practicing, even if they get hit sometimes, that's fine. They're still trying to do as many defenses as possible and still doing attacks back, so keeping it quite balanced. But whenever they can, trying to get a disarm on and offend the person back. Now, the big advantage, and this is when I'm get, sort of getting around to um, the freeing, what I mentioned about freeing up the people fighting, the big advantage to this is it takes ego out of the equation to a large extent, never 100%, but to a very large extent, because both people know, and they don't know what each other's objectives are. That's very important. Okay, You tell the people what their objectives are secretly, because you never know what the opponent's objective, or you don't often know what the opponent's exact objectives are when they're trying to hit you with a weapon um, in a real fight. So what that means is both people know that they're trying to succeed to their own criteria. Therefore, if you're, if you're getting hit a lot, you don't think, ah, I'm really losing at this. What you're really thinking about is thinking, okay, well, I'm getting hit a lot, but I'm, trying, I'm practicing trying to do this thing I've been told to do. So it really frees up both the people to focus on trying to practice that objective and not only think about points and trying to think about how many times they're hitting the opponent and how many times they're getting hit. Now, I'm not saying don't do that type of simple scoring sparring because that should always be there as well. But I'm really becoming a massive fan of this objective-based um, sparring for a whole raft of reasons that hopefully I've kind of encapsulated in, in this explanation. And, and I think, one of, like I say, one of the underlying most important aspects to it is to get people out of continually doing the same old techniques over and over and over again because they can make those techniques work. You want people to practice these other techniques that they're not so good at. You want people to get better at the things that they don't already know how to do. And this is one mechanism for doing that. I hope that gives you some things to think about. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.